it's just really great to be here with you all after having heard lovely stories about your community. Really, um, just really love Elle and her family, so it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, let's pray briefly before we get into our text for today. Heavenly Parent, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning. Amen. I'll be reading Luke 18, 9 to 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is God's word for us. So Jesus decides in this parable, this teaching story, uh, with a group of people, he decides to tell this parable to a group of people who are confident in their own righteousness. So they knew they were good and virtuous in God's eyes. They also then, it says, viewed other people with contempt because they knew that they were more righteous than the other people around them. This could very well have been a group of Pharisees or religious leaders. Um, I'm assuming Jesus' female and male disciples were part of the crowd here. Um, And generally, I'm just envisioning the diverse crowds that followed Jesus everywhere he went. So Jesus begins this parable with the self-righteous Pharisee who's standing far away from everyone else. And I envision he's praying aloud like really dramatically. God, I thank you that I am not like these unrighteous evildoers, specifically that guy over there. Thank you that I am so much better than him. (laughs) Who prays like that? (laughs) It's like some weird form of like, I don't know, humble bragging in a prayer or like the most manipulative, prescriptive form of prayer I can think of that just kind of makes me want to gag. I mean, can you believe this guy? Thank God we're not like him, right? I mean, we would never stand in overt judgment of someone else in our prayers. Okay, I'm guessing you can all catch on to the sarcasm. It's almost as if this story is crafted to lead us to respond to the Pharisee as he responds to the tax collector. Like the parables leading us to think in the way Jesus is teaching us not to think, right? We judge that Pharisee just as we're told not to do here. Why would Jesus craft a parable this way? I think maybe he's inviting his listeners and us to be realistic about how we so easily and often publicly judge others. In contrast to this judgmental, self-righteous Pharisee, Jesus then tells us of a tax collector standing also apart from the other worshipers. He can't even lift his eyes up to the heavens because he is so ashamed. He knows he is so unrighteous of his own accord. He knows he needs God's grace and mercy to be made well. This is the guy, Jesus says. This is the one who is righteous, virtuous, justified before God. In the kingdom of heaven, or we could say in the rule, reign, and family of God, it is the humble who are exalted. Perhaps for those of us who've grown up in the church, or if we've heard this parable before, this might seem like an obvious descriptor of God's kingdom. Humility is a virtue in God's family. But for those to whom Jesus was speaking, this is a pretty radical story. Because in their eyes, the Pharisee was obviously the righteous person in the scenario. 
he was doing all the right things. The Pharisee was doing everything he was supposed to do, tithing 10%, uh, fasting regularly. Culturally, this Pharisee had earned the right to pray in this way. That is to say, his own righteousness earned him the right to judge the unrighteous tax collector. But in this story, and indeed in his life of ministry, Jesus is taking what his listeners know about God and about God's kingdom and flipping it upside down. He's inviting them to understand the power structures of the world are the opposite of the power structures in God's family. The last shall be first, the humble shall be exalted, those who mourn shall be called blessed. It's not just about what you do and if we're checking off the right boxes, it's about our hearts. Jesus came to modify and expand our understanding of what it means to be the people of God. Jesus came to invite his people to repent, or we could also say to turn away from the judgment in their hearts, which is a way we seek to wield power over others, and to believe, to seek the grace of God within God's family of radical love and inclusion. Thereby, in this story, Jesus ends up elevating an unlikely saint, someone we wouldn't expect to be taught by, the tax collector. For Jesus' audience, the tax collector was the obvious unrighteous person in the story. Tax collectors in the Jewish world were social outcasts. Yes, they often had wealth, but it was because they were seen as traitors to their people. They were working in collusion with the Roman, the occupying Roman Empire. And yet, Jesus lifts up this tax collector, this obvious sinner in the eyes of the people listening. He lifts him up as the humble and righteous one before God. To his audience, Jesus is flipping the power structure as they know it by calling out the Pharisee, the righteous one, and lifting up the tax collector, the unrighteous one. Jesus is inviting them to see what God really values, the heart of a person, and the humility with which they engage God and the people around them, and not the way they know how to follow rules perfectly, while harboring hatred and judgment of others in their heart. For his audience at the time, and for us today, this is a hard teaching. <laughs> okay, Jesus, let me just turn down, uh, you know, turn up my humble meter and I will just stop judging everyone around me. <laughs> I don't know about you, that does not work for me. <laughs> I don't know how to instantly just like transform my judgment into humility because we're all judgmental, right? I mean, let's just, let's just name it. And perhaps that's why Jesus tells this parable in a way that we're drawn to automatically judge the Pharisee. I think Jesus wants to force us to be honest about how we tend to judge others. And if we're being really honest, it's not hard for us to call to mind the people we judge, right? Especially during an election season, there is ample opportunity for judgment, right? Ugh, those Republicans. Ugh, those Democrats. Ugh, those independents. Thank God I'm not one of those fundamental conservatives. Thank God I'm not a flaming liberal. Thank God I am not a tax collector. Repenting, turning away from our own tendencies toward judgment, toward judgment might just be one of the ways we could practice humility. So this morning, I want to invite us, just let's take a minute to consider, and if you feel called, confess before God, who are we finding ourselves judging lately? Repent and believe. In this parable, Jesus teaches us about the importance of humility in God's kingdom and family. But humility on its own is not the entirety of the gospel. I'm struck by the fact that both men in this story were on their own, separate 
from the other worshipers. Both the Pharisee and the tax collector were missing out on the beauty of life in community. This is the radical nature of God's kingdom. The humble are exalted and the self-righteous are brought low, but that just puts them in the same place, <laughs> on the same level. The gospel, the work of Jesus, is this great equalizer, leading us all to see and understand that we're all just the same. We are all God's children, deeply loved and desired by God. The gospel is not just stop judging, be humble. <laughs> I mean, we know the invitation to humility is a piece of it, right? But the larger invitation of the gospel is to a shared life of love and grace in God's radically inclusive family. Although this parable leads us to emulate the tax collector, God doesn't want followers who are just hunched over, trapped, paralyzed in their guilt and shame, not even able to look God in the face. God wants to be with us. That is why Jesus came to earth. God wants to be in real, loving relationship with all people and creation. Um, so I, I, I'll just pause for a second. I feel ridiculous referencing the Greek as I'm sitting in El's spot, who I know is just one of the most gifted translators. <laughs> and I had to text our Tuesday morning preaching peace group to say, wait, what was that Greek word again? <laughs> but the Greek word that's used here for far off or standing apart is makrothen. Luke uses this word to describe where the tax collector is standing. And it is the same word used to describe the prodigal when the prodigal's father sees him from far off. And we know that the father sees him from far off and runs to him with love and compassion in his heart. Just as the prodigal's father saw him from far off, so too God sees us from far off, sees our hearts, and with all love and compassion wants to be in relationship with us as family. The fullness of the gospel, the invitation of God to all people and creation is to deeper, life-giving relationship with God and with each other. We weren't created to be alone on the fringes, neither wallowing in self-judgment nor, oh, I've just flipped it up. Okay, let's start that again. Neither wallowing in our judgmental self-righteousness on one end, right? Nor our shame-filled regret on this end. We were created for grace and community, just as our three-in-one God is divine community. We are invited to walk through the difficulties of this life together, to share our joys and our struggles with one another. The work of Jesus is this great equalizer, knocking down our human power structures, uniting both Pharisees and tax collectors in God's family, that we may do life together with each other and with God and invite others to join us in doing the same.